morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and the organization for the, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be here. This is a, a very international audience, and a, but also a very young audience. But I hope you still remember the uh, tragic events of uh, 2011, um, 2001. So everyone who was um, old enough to remember, remember exactly what they were doing on that day when the uh, two planes uh, attacked the, the Twin Towers in the US, in New York. What most people don't know is that after that event or those events, uh, there was a trial that lasted for many, many years uh, whose purpose was to, to answer exactly that question. If what happened on that day was one event, composed of two parts, or two events. And this sounds like a crazy, uh, even distasteful question, given the tragedy and the human loss, but this was um, deciding if what happened on September 2001 was an event or two events was not a million dollar question. This was a $3.5 billion question. Because the towers were insured for $3.5 billion for each destructive event. So I'll give you a minute, well, we don't have a minute, so I'll give you a few seconds just to form an opinion in your mind. One event composed of two parts or two events. If you believe these were two events, probably you are articulating a notion of events which are defined, delimited, individuated by the spatial temporal regions, the, the region they occupy. So you say it's two events, two different towers, two different planes, two different participants. One could have happened without the other and so on. If you are like the, uh, the lawyers of the insurance company, the argument would go in a different direction. You would say, well, these are not just events. These are actions. These are intentional events. Uh, it would have been different if the towers had been uh, hit by two meteorites, for example. No one would argue if the, that the, these are two different things, two different occurrences. But actions, intentional events, are brought about by intention. So one single plan, one single event. Either way, if you are articulating the story or these arguments, in either way, what you are doing is ontology. This 2,400-year-old uh, discipline um, that would deal with the meaning of concepts, with the concepts that we use to articulate our, our models of uh, reality. So behind each of these arguments, there is a, an ontology, lowercase o, which is a kind of theory about what kinds of entities and their ties are assumed to exist for that description to make sense, for it to have meaning. And you do that by using ontology with uh, capital O, which this area devotes to developing a kind of toolbox, conceptual toolbox for doing ontological analysis. So what you're doing when trying to make this case is thinking about identity, about individuation, about parthood, and, and so on. Actually, um, the whole case hangs on ontology and an ontological discussion. Actually, the, in the appeal, so the, initially the, uh, the lawyers of uh, representing the, the insurance company actually won the case by making this argument that these are intentional events, and then they, they lost in the appeal, so one became two, because um, the lawyers of the Twin Towers actually managed to show that uh, they didn't have a very clear definition of occurrence, and the documents they had signed before um, had the notion of occurrence or event which was much stricter. So again, the whole case was hanging on, on this. So why do I like this example so much? First, there is no doubt that there about the brute reality. So people are not questioning, well, some people are, but no one is seriously questioning that those things happen. It's not about what happened, it's about how do you extract facts from this brute reality by using a certain uh, system of categories. So facts are not in reality per se, but they are carved out of reality by using a system of categories, a given theory of the world. Second, there are multiple views that you can take on the same brute reality, but 
And these views can conflict, so one event or two events, but unless we are fully aware of the ontology behind, that you use to carve out these different alternative facts, uh, we cannot safely ha harmonize those different views. Right? So you have to do this in a very explicit way so that we can understand if we're talking about the same thing or not, and if we have the same notion of event or not. Three, and this is an important one, there is no data that would answer this question. There is no, it's not an empirical question. There is no experiment in the world that would settle this question if this is one event or two events. This can only be solved by an exercise on conceptual clarification, on mini negotiation, by using this a prioristic system of categories. And fourth, Reality is not only represented by these choices, by this system of categories, but reality is in a sense created by that. So in a sense, when we convince people to share our given, uh, a given worldview or our given ontology, and we extract from that the fact that there was one event or two events, this will, have, this will create reality. This will have implications. We'll create institutional facts. We'll create claims and duties and obligations and liabilities and so on. Why am I telling you this in a computing conference? Because that's exactly what we do when we build systems. We are dealing with these four different dimensions that I just uh, mentioned. Every information system embeds a given representation of reality according to a particular worldview. So even the most mundane database, let's say a database about transplants, this thing, in order for it to make sense, it believes it has to commit, to make an ontological commitment to a given theory of the real world in which there are people who can be living or deceased transplants, roles played in transplants by people like surgeons, donors, and donees, and respecting some constraints, like for example, people cannot be, people have to be either living or deceased, and not both, and you cannot donate an organ to yourself and perform the transplant. So surgeons, donors, and donees are people, but not the same people in the scope of the same transplant, for example. This idea that every information system embeds a given ontology in this sense, was put forth the first time by uh, George Milley, the creator of Milley Automata in computer science in a paper in 1967. And Milley was kind of complaining that we computer scientists, I'm a computer scientist, although hanging out with philosophers for too long maybe, um, that, that we computer scientists, we get obsessed with technology and we like to play with symbols, right? Computers are symbol manipul manipulation machines. And we deal with formal semantics, we deal with transformations, and Milly was making the point that that's all fine, but that's just the beginning of the story. We have to understand, we have to answer the question of which symbols, what do these symbols mean? How they connect to things out there in the world? And, this, and that data is always a representation of a theory of the real world, and this is an issue of ontology. Second point, modern information systems are built in a collective and distributed manner. All, there is no green, greenfield development anymore in information systems. You build systems to be integrated with other systems, or you build systems by integrating existing systems that often, very often, are built by different people in a completely concurrent, autonomous way. So if we look at the four Vs of big data, well, there is a total unbalance there, right? So the, the real effort and the real challenges in the, on the two Vs on the right side, almost our, our effort is dealing with variety and, with, velocity and uh, with veracity on how the data connects to the world again. Data quality is about that. Um, volume and velocity are very important, but we, we seem to be uh, way ahead in, in, in knowing how to deal with these issues. And the, the, the reason uh, behind that is because all interesting questions we need to have answered in science, in organizations, in, in government, can only be answered if we put together data silos that were developed in a completely concurrent, independent way. So take this example. I want to know that the company donates money to a political campaign. This is a campaign of a politician, and the politician either directs a governmental agency or has a close relationship with someone who does, and this governmental agency has 
a contract with that, uh, with that company. And you want to you know, put a magnifying glass over that contract and see what's going on there, right? In order to answer this question, first you need to work out the meaning of some of these notions. So what does has close relationship mean? You have to deal with a number of temporal issues, right? With uh, things in the world that will make true some of these propositions embedded here in a given uh, time interval. So people are allocated to organizational units in a given point in time. Organization units are part of different organizational units in a given point in time. Uh, money is donated, contracts happen in time. Uh, if you direct a, a, a governmental agency in a given point in time, you direct everything which is part of the agents, which are the parts of the parts of the parts of the agents. So there are a bunch of semantic issues that you have to, uh, f you know, uh, flesh out here. But and, and the data that you need to answer this question is out there, the, in the ether. The problem is it's out there like in four or five different databases, and which were created by different people, different organizations in different points in time. And it's very, very hard to connect all these different databases to answer a fundamental question uh, such as this one. So if every information system embeds an ontology, has a theory of the, the real world, connecting the information systems is actually finding out the, the relation between these reference, which are represented in the systems, the relation between these worldviews or these different ontologies. So how does transplant here on the left relate to transplant on the right? How does person on the left relate to person on the right? Can I assume this should be a relation of identity just because I'm using the same lexical terms on each side? If one of identity, what does that mean? What does it mean for something to be identical uh, with something else? We know identity is an equivalence relation, right? So everything is identical to itself. If A is identical to B, B is identical to A. It's a transitive relation as well. So if A is identical to B, B is identical to C, A is identical to C. But also it, identity obeys what's called Leibniz law. So if two things are identical, they necessarily in all possible worlds have the same property, which means that whatever I find out about C, in this case, it propagates back to A. It's a very strong relation. If not one of identity, what are the alternatives? Maybe specialization, composition, dependence, and then there are different types of dependence and so on. So that toolbox that I mentioned, ontology with the capital O, is exactly what we need in order to find out what kind of relations would connect person here on the left and person on the right. and uh, and uh, make explicit what that would entail. So what are the formal properties of this relation? It seems easy, right? But take this, this very simple notion of person. So what do we mean by person, really? Do, you, do we mean a human being? Do we mean a cognitively capable human being? So for example, if I'm brain dead, I'm not legally a person anymore. If I have brain damage and I, I'm not able to participate in legal relations, I'm not legally a person. Do we mean a cognitively capable human being that it's either an adult or an emancipated minor. This would be a, a third different notion of person. Or do we mean a legal person that would include the third definition plus organizations, or any, uh, the notion of legal party? Let's, let me give you another example. What do we mean by software when we talk about software and we represent software in these different systems? Do we mean software code? Software code is defined by any um, any description in a Turing complete language, but its identity criterion is a synthetic one. So if I include, if I modularize the code, it's a different code. If I include comments, it's a different code. If I change the name of variables, it's a different code, but it's still the same program because it's still the same class of executions. Now, think of Microsoft Word that I think turned uh, 40 uh, years old. So what does it mean? What is there that it's still the same and is now is turning 40? It's not the same code for 40 years and it's not the same class of executions. It's something else that gives the identity for this thing, namely uh, uh, the, the preservation of some essential requirements. What about software product? That's something else altogether. So when Microsoft, for example, buys Skype, it's not buying code at all. It, it very often throws away the code for different reasons, for, for uh, intellectual property reasons, for example, and rebuilds the code. So what Microsoft is buying when buying uh, uh, Skype and creating a software product is about the commitments and claims and liabilities and powers that it has with respect to a community of users. Third point, software is 
eating the world. So this was a point made by uh, Mark Andreessen, who created Netscape, uh, in a Wall Street, uh, Street Journal article in 2017. And his point was, everything is turning to software, right? Think about your biggest retailer, your biggest TV channel, your biggest uh, telecommunication provider, your biggest transportation company, they are all software company. Of course, Andreessen was right, but I, I think he missed the opportunity of saying something much stronger. That software is actually creating the world in the sense that we, we just mentioned. So in the past, or actually forever, since we have social reality, social reality is created by our ability to connect brute facts with institutional facts. That's how painted paper counts as money in a given context, or coined metal counts as money. Now, this brute fact of painted paper, or handshakes, and signed paper, and uh, coined metal, all of this is being replaced by digital facts. So, property rights, um, contracts, marriages, and employments, and enrollments, and presidential mandates, and money, and so on, this is all grounded in digital facts, which are created by connecting systems. So digital, digital facts which are created in a distributed way. So for example, when we click here, what we're creating is social reality. We're creating an institutional fact that, again, it's a social relation, a legal relation. So just very quick summary. Every software embeds a certain theory of the world. Connecting software is connecting these different theories. We need the right tools to do this. Otherwise, we will create facts out of this um, composition of software, which become social and legal facts, which are just mistaken. So how do we stand as a discipline, as an information system engineering discipline? Well, not so well. If we, if we look at enterprise software, for example, it's a, it's a complete uh, nightmare. So if you take a, a university, for example, with 10,000 people, we have this university will be dealing with 100 systems. The sum of tables, database tables in the system is around 10,000 tables. Uh, each of the tables will have on average 10 uh, elements, so we are 100K elements. You write like 10 lines of code for each of these elements on average. So we are looking at uh, 1 million lines of code. And, uh, you know, we, we have statistics on this, and we, we have on, on average 15 to uh, 50 dormant bugs for 1K lines of code. So we can just do the math, right? And I'm not even mentioning the cost of missed opportunity for not being able to connect information. So I guess you will recognize this. Even in my university, it's like this. 6,000 employees, 100 applications, 1 million lines of code, 10,000 tables. Question is, where do these 10,000 tables come from? It's a university, for God's sake. It's very hard to come up with 100 concepts you're dealing with. So how do we go from 100 concepts like class, student, lecture, lecture room, supervision relation, enrollment, assignment of professor to teach, and so on to 10,000? So what's going on there? And most of the money we spend in enterprise software is on enterprise application integration. Part of this problem is due to our failure to do this semantic ontological work right when creating these theories which are embedded in these systems. We are too obsessed, like Millie said uh, in 67, called attention for in 67, we are still too much obsessed with, uh, with form, with logics. Logics is great, I'm, I'm kind of a logician my, myself, but it's just part of the story. We are too much obsessed with symbols, with symbolic structure. And of course, as uh, beautifully illustrated in the, in the analytical language of John Wilkins by, by the great Argentinian writer uh, Jorge Luis Borges, Borges, we had this, uh, in, in the story, we had this encyclopedia called the Celest Celestial Emporium of Benevolent Knowledge that that uh, has a very uh, a completely alternative way of classifying animals or organizing taxonomy of animals, right? Those that belong to the emperor, those that resemble flies from a distance, the fabulous ones, the embalmed ones, and so on. Those that resemble flies from a distance is a logically possible way to group objects, but it's not how we make sense of the world. No real language would have a noun for such a category. Real nouns capture kinds of things. 
Our classifications don't just exist to avoid chaos, to create structure. They are theories about the basis of natural order. It doesn't mean that we all have to agree with the same worldview, but we have to articulate our worldviews in a way that is both explicit and consistent. So we need to carve reality at its joints, in a sense. So this, the, 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 the sentence comes from Plato. Well, the other road in which, uh, so trying to assess uh, the, how things are and where do we stand, the other road is, you know, forget structures, right? So we are alternating between structures which are purely formal and the structures and no structure. So this idea, what I call radical naive empiricism, this idea that you can absolutely learn everything from data, the idea that you don't need a prioristic structures there at all. So here are a few problems with this idea, right? First of all, learning never happens in the vacuum. You need some innate structure anyway to learn. And we can discuss this if you're, if you're interested. Second, data is also always data about something. So you decide, you made a conceptual choice of deciding to measure a certain property in the world in a certain way at a certain level of granularity and so on. So you're kind of doing conceptual work anyway, sometimes without the right tools in a, in a hidden manner. Again, variety. So data integration requires this kind of work I'm talking about. Veracity, data quality as well. Another point, data itself cannot tell signal apart for, uh, from noise. So as important as choosing and as having, the, so having the right data is deciding which kind of data items to ignore. And also, the world is always underdetermined by the data, right? So we never have, we have enough data to, to actually uh, approximate the world in situations which are which are, which are uncommon, which are outside the, uh, the most frequent, frequent case. So actually reality is too long tailed. That's why you see cases in, a, that's why we don't have really autonomous vehicles outside very uh, well controlled envelopes. Um, why? Because you know, you can uh, train the car to stop at a, uh, a person, but then what happens if there is a plastic bag fly in front of and including the person. So what do you do? And what about two plastic bags? And, and so on and so forth, right? So even if you get more data, we end up getting data about the same things because we have this fringe phenomena that are very uh, unfrequent, but there are just too many of them, too many strange things that can happen. So by having a theory of the real world, a car we, which will have a common sense theory of the real world doesn't have new data. To, uh, to stop at a, you know, a flying plastic bag flying in front of, the, of a person. Also, I think if we go this way, we are doomed by, uh, by a lack of explainability. I don't see a way out uh, out this. Because the explanation, so explanation to explain is actually to reveal the semantics behind the data and to reveal the ontology behind the data. So the explanation is not in the data itself. It's in the real world theory which is represented in the data. So I, I think you know, I cannot explain this better than this uh, cartoon by uh, Tom Gould. Says, have you noticed that the farmer has been using the words ham, bacon, and sausage a lot lately? Yeah, what do you think they mean? I'm gonna find out. And then you know, the pig comes back and says, Maurice, I got some really bad news. So if you understood that, think for a second why you got the joke. It's not there, it's not in the data. In order to understand the joke, you have to understand that ham, bacon, and sausage, uh, sausages are uh, pork-based products, that pork has a, bears a historical relation with entities which are instance of the type pig, and unfortunately, Maurice and his friend are instance of the type pig. The whole story is not in the data. So if you think about Shapley values as an explanation, what you're doing is correlating certain input and output, but you, there is, it, it's answering the knowing that question, but not the knowing why question. So if you know that certain genes correlate with a certain disease, but you don't know why. So what are the 
metabolical pathways and the causal connections there that connect these two things. So what we need is what I call meaningful uh, computing. Meaning both in the sense of semantics and meaning in the sense of uh, significance or purpose. The idea, a meaningful computing paradigm, a paradigm shift that will, put, that will move away from the, our obsession with uh, symbol manipulation, with performance, with doing more and more with more data, a uh, paradigm that would connect a reality, um, cognition and ethics, and computation. So we cannot leave this to the philosophers and the cognitive science as well. The problem is too hard. We have both to embed this in computation, but we also have need computation in order to understand these notions. And that's what we've been working on, uh, my group, for quite some time, building an interdisciplinary uh, program leveraging theories from philosophy, in particular formal ontology, ethics, logics, cognitive science and linguistics, to develop theories, modeling language, methodologies, and computational tools that uh, support building information systems that uh, preserve, that are trustworthy because they are semantically precise, ontologically transparent, cognitively tractable and explainable, and that can support um, humans in problem-solving tasks that satisfy human goals and respect human values and norms. So it's, it's, it shouldn't be about AI, it should be about IA. Pretty much at the same time that people coined the term artificial intelligence, which is not a great term, by the way, um, uh, JCR Licklider proposes idea of IA, of intelligence augmentation. The whole purpose of computation and of what back then Herb Simon, the Turing Award winner, Nobel Prize winner, proposed to call AI uh, uh, complex information processing, Licklider said complex information processing should be about endowing humans with newer cap capabilities such that we can solve uh, problems that are important to us. Thank you.